Namaste. So chapter 12, oh boy, huh? It's a bear, very complicated structures. But let's back up and try to get a little perspective on it. What has she been doing, not only in chapter 12, but everything up to this point? She is giving a background. She's giving the structure of the creation. She's showing us, really, how screwed we are. <laughs> because without her help, we are totally trapped in material existence. And even people who reject God, they feel like this. Huh? Jean-Paul Sartre, the great existentialist French author, wrote, was famous for writing his book, No Exit, meaning that we're stuck here in suffering and there's no way out. Too bad. Well, of course it isn't like that. God is not without compassion. And we'll see in the next chapters, beginning with chapter 13, she starts to open up about the way out. She starts to reveal, well, just about everything about sadhana, meditation, worship, and so on. And how God's mercy is really available to everyone. The problem is very few will step up and take it. So if we don't receive it, you know, what can she do? <laughs> well, she gives in this one chapter, really a capsule description of the whole human psychology. And it's not very favorable, you know, it's not very optimistic. Let's take a look at the structure of the beginning of the chapter, the first couple of paragraphs. Sri, the goddess, divides the whole creation into two. Isha, the lord, the controller, and Ishitavya, that which is governed. So of the Ishitavya, that is divided into Bhotra, the enjoyer, or the jiva, the soul, and Bhogya, that which is enjoyed. Now let's look at Bhogya for a minute. You have Kala, time, and Kalya, influenced by time. So of course, everything in the material world is influenced by time. It comes into existence at a certain time, it exists for a certain time, and then it passes away or changes into something else. So the whole world is moving under the control of time. But what is time in relation to the jiva? Time is the temptress. Uh, time throws up all these objects in front of us and says, oh, look at this, look at that. You know, trying to grab our attention, even competing for our attention. So she is the temptress in one sense who leads us astray. Take a look again. The Boktra, the enjoyer, is misled by the temptress into the five kleshas. A klesha means an illusion that leads to suffering. And what are these five? Moha, bewilderment. Tamas, ignorance. Maha Moha, the great bewilderment of thinking that you're an individual. Andha, the suffering. And Avidya, the uh, wrong knowledge. Vidya means knowledge, but Avidya means the wrong knowledge. Knowledge that takes us away from self-realization. And of course, this describes all mundane knowledge. Even if it's, you know, true technically, but because it's based on or in the context of 
There is no God in control. We are the only ones with intelligence, we human beings. Huh? We have to figure everything out and make up our minds for ourselves. And yada, yada, yada. You know the spiel, huh? This is material conditioning and material knowledge. And of course, this simply leads us to more bondage in the material world. Being subject to karma and having to take birth after birth after birth. So, what is the way out? Let's look at the next section. She starts to describe her five functions. And those are tirobhava, disappearance. In other words, she disappears from our sight. We can't see her, she hides. Srishti, creation. That's the creation of the material world and everything in it. Stiti, maintenance. After it's created, then she supports it. Samhriti, destruction. And finally, anugraha, deliverance, salvation, self-realization. Anugraha is going to be covered in chapter 13, but everything else is described in this chapter. So let's take a little closer look. Tirobhava means that she hides from us, and this leads to the klesha, the five kinds of suffering that we mentioned before. There's tamas, ignorance, which leads to avidya, wrong knowledge. Then that leads to mahamoha, asmita, the wrong thinking of identifying the self as the body and its extensions or possessions or relations. Then there's raga. Raga means vasanas or the impressions that we receive from the senses and mind connected with a pleasant asmita. And in this case, asmita means an interpretation. Then there's dvesha, which means the same vasanas or impressions along with unpleasant asmita. Uh, and pleasant and unpleasant is simply an interpretation that we make. It's a judgment based on our desires, what we like and what we don't like. There's no actual objective basis to it. You know, what's in style this year is out of style next year. And you know how that goes. And then finally, there's anda. Anda means here we are working very hard to attain things that are pleasant, and avoid things that are unpleasant. But we have this anxiety that maybe it's not going to work. Huh? Everybody has this anxiety, and it's called anta. <laughs> this doesn't go away until one attains self-realization or is blessed with enlightenment. Now let's look at the next one, the srishti, the creation. Creation has these five levels. Prajapatya means the reproduction of species beginning in the early universe, when the universe has to be populated. That leads to bhaviki, or becoming. And that means the creation of the stars, planets, galaxies, whatever, you know, the, the hardware <laughs> that nature runs on. So that also then leads to bhautiki. Bhautiki means nature or the environment or the uh, bio system. And that leads to bhava. Bhava means becoming, but in the context of the three gunas, sattva guna or goodness, raja guna or passion, and tamo guna or ignorance. And in the material world, these are all mixed up together. None of them are pure once the creation is manifested, and they're always vying for supremacy. So it leads to a situation where all these things are mixed up together, and it's hard to know what is what. Then we have the linga, the subtle body of the living beings, 
and the sharira, the gross body. And of course, all these have many different parts and uh, functioning principles. And we don't need to go into too much detail to understand that srishti means just the whole ball of wax, you know, the whole creation. From top to bottom, from inside out. <laughs> and that we, sitting here in these gross bodies, are the end product of it all. So see, she's, she's drawing a picture and has been for the, since the beginning of the book, giving us the background or the structure of the whole universe, the structure of the trap that we're caught in. Oh, and then it gets better. <laughs> she talks about stiti, maintenance, that she coexists with Vishnu, she coexists with the Manus, who are the lords of the Manvantaras, or the great units of time. Then she coexists with the sons of the Manus, who are like the great sages and the principal demigods. And finally, she coexists with the creation. And here, coexistence means like cooperation and support. That she is everything in one sense. And in another sense, she supports everything. Without her, Nothing could exist at all. And this whole book so far, the first 12 chapters, has been an elaborate description of the structures and powers that she uses to create and support the universe. Oh, but there's more. <laughs> Sanghriti. Sanghriti means destruction. And so there are seven levels of destruction. The nitya samhriti, where, mean, where, uh, which means individual death of the body. The naimittiki samhriti, where she destroys the three worlds at the end of the kalpa. A kalpa is, you know, many yuga cycles. Then at the end, Lord Brahma goes into mystic sleep, and the whole three worlds are inundated with the ocean of destruction. And they're merged within that ocean for the whole of Brahma's night, which is equal to the duration of his day. Many, many kalpas. And then again, the creation is manifested. Then what? Prakriti samhriti, which is the destruction of Mahat. What is Mahat? Mahat is the total sum of all the tattvas. We talked about the tattvas back in chapter 5 or so. And there are 22 or 32 or 34 or 27, depending on who's doing the analysis. The different basic elements of the material creation. So these tattvas, the sum total of all these tattvas is the mahat. And after the kalpas are destroyed, she destroys the mahat also at the end of the creation. The next level is prasuti samhriti. And this is when she destroys prakriti itself. Prakriti is the principle of nature, as opposed to mahat, which is the high level manifestation of nature. So it is a subtle thing and once Prakriti is destroyed, there is no more creation. This is the final annihilation. Then, Mayi Samhriti, where she destroys Prasuti, Mahalakshmi, Mahakali, and Mahasaraswati, the three principal goddesses that are identified with the Gunas. So at, at this level, this is very high. Uh, these are the principal goddesses in control of the modes of nature. And so when once they're destroyed, there's no going back. The creation is finished. Then, Shakti Samhriti, where she destroys Maya. She destroys the power of illusion itself. So this is getting mighty close to home. And finally... Atyantiki Samhriti, 
Now, we're very interested in this because what she does in this type of destruction is destroy the subtle body of the muktas. The muktas are the lucky living entities who get to experience liberation or enlightenment. They are excused from the round of birth and death. They are blessed with all pervading knowledge. They directly perceive Brahman and they are then freed from all their karma. And of course, this is a wonderful thing. And she will discuss this in full in the next chapter, chapter 13, about Anugraha. Anugraha is the fifth function. And Anugraha, of course, means blessing or mercy, and it's based on compassion, and it's very, very wonderful. So don't despair. To put this all in perspective, she's painted the picture and now she's going to show us, now she has showed us actually where we are in that picture. And next step, beginning with the next chapter, is about the way out. How to qualify for the blessings that lead to complete enlightenment. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.